and we're on Facebook and we're here. So let's, uh, let's get started with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we can be here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for all your mercies. We ask, dear God, as we look into your word, Father, that you illuminate our minds and our hearts, Father, and help us, dear God, to have a great understanding of your word, Father, and certainly to apply it to our lives. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pick up on 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we left off uh, on verse 8, so we're going to read that little section there, and uh, and then take those verses, see how far we get, because obviously I have, I have a more detailed notes. So there's certain passages where you have more detailed notes than other passages. This is one of the passages where I have more detailed notes than others because of the topic. So we're going to read verse 6 through 10. 1 Timothy 6, right. 6 through 10. Everybody there? Yeah. All right. Uh, Victor, would you read that for us, 6 through 10? Yeah, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money and wander from the faith, and pierce themselves with many griefs. Amen. Any any questions before we jump in? Okay. Well, we have been looking at this passage, and we saw that uh, Paul begins to address here in chapter 6 the fact that um, these false teachers are using Christianity, are using religion to make a buck to uh, to get wealthier, which, of course, is not uncommon back then. It was not, uh, it's not uncommon today. Uh, swindlers who, who see the advantage of, of taking advantage of Christianity or any religion, any belief system that will help them to, to make money. And of course, some people do it through through Christianity, through religion. Some people do it through other, other means, you know, whether it's politics or whatever, to get people addicted to, to watching them and, and, and giving money to them and whatnot. And people fall for this stuff. And so Paul first addresses that, and then he addresses the whole issue of money when it comes to... Uh, Christians, especially ministers, and he talks about the importance of having godliness with uh, with contentment, the importance of of having Christian virtue, Christian godliness, and 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 having uh, contentment be married to that that idea of being satisfied with what God has given you, and and not to be lusting after uh, the things of this world. Again, we're going to see that it's not a question of money, and it's not a question of acquiring money. It's a question of lusting after money. Right. I, Having this love, this uh, obsession, and some people are obsessed with money. You know, it's not even. You know, they're always trying to get more and more and more. They're not. They're never content with never what they have. Never satisfied. Never satisfied, and that's yeah. really and that's really what's being condemned here. So again, it's not against. There were, uh, just like today, there were there were wealthy Christians back then, and today, of course, any of us compared to the early church is wealthy because we're. Middle class today is like rich compared in the in the ancient world. There, there was poverty, real, real. Poverty. We're talking like they were, they were like Haiti. They were like uh, Africa. They were not like us. We, you know, mm-hmm. even middle class people today live very well. Um, but again, something that all of us have to be aware of, not to get caught up with this uh, infection of greed. So, so let's catch up where we were, and we were on verse eight, and we're going to start from there. Paul says. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Uh, this leads to a question. For the Christian, how much is enough? Paul's principle implies a, a standard a standard, a material sufficiency that is minimal. Food and clothing ought to be enough. Uh, while Paul may be quoting popular philosophy, like the Stoics who, who uh, live with contentment, it's far more likely, of course, that he's drawing on the model of Christ. And, and Christ calling us not to be anxious about tomorrow, not to be anxious about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, um, but to, to, uh, to trust in God and to rely upon God. He does not say anything of negative about living above the minim, about this minimum standard, though he will teach that life at a higher material level carries with it heavy obligations. Uh, but he does say that real contentment and material prosperity have nothing to do with one another. And greed has nothing to do with godliness. And anytime you see individuals who try to sell a form of Christianity, 
that is married to greed, that is not Christianity. Um, greed is greed. Greed is a sin. Uh, greed is not good. Uh, so, you know, unless you change what greed means, gre greed by its very definition is contrary to the spirit of Christ. How can the Christian learn to be content with simple living? Uh, certainly not by accepting the standards of this world. Uh, Paul suggests that the eternal perspective uh, and an attitude of detachment toward things are what is needed. Uh, we have to have an eternal perspective. We have to have the perspective uh, that Christ taught us concerning where our treasure should be, um, where really where our heart should be. And if we place it in the things of this world, we will never be content. We will never find happiness. If we place it in Christ, we will have that. Uh, and also not only to be uh, not only to have that perspective of, of our future and what we should be relying upon, but also to have a sen a real sense of detachment. Yes, enjoy all things that God has given to you, but don't don't let your mind be married to it where you're obsessed with it. You know, like I think you know, I like I, I love my books. I love having my books, but I should not even be married to my books. You know, I should know that hey, you know, um, they're just books. If they get destroyed, they're books, and they can be replaced or whatnot. And one day, you know, I'll, I'll be retiring and moving to a smaller place or doing something. I, I will have need of books, you know, so uh, to be able to let go of them as well. And that's why one of the reasons I do, I don't have no problem giving gifts, giving my books away, because I think that's part of the reason that we have books, to, to, you know, to learn and then to be able to share with others. So, uh, but I think this is our, our mindset has to be detachment, not I, I say books because I don't have attachment to other things like that. I don't have attachment to. I don't. I really don't. I mean, I, I don't. Have, you know, I have a car and a car for just four wheels and and doors and drive, takes me from point A to point. I don't really care about the car. Uh, I don't care about the house. You know, I'm I'm very I'm very. Uh, uh, but I love my books. That's true. That's I, I. You know, I'm constantly getting books. I'm constantly reading. I can't get enough of it. So yeah, you know. But again, I can't be. I can't be addicted to it. I can't let it control me. Um, uh, and again, so eternal perspective and a detachment. I want to go a little deeper into these words. Uh, clothing in the Greek is actually, uh, the word means covering, which can refer to clothing or uh, to shelter as well. So it's not simply clothing that uh, the, the word, I mean, here is render clothing, but in the Greek, it can also mean, it just means any kind of covering. So it could also refer to, 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 to shelter. So again, Paul's saying, in effect, if you have the basics of life, you have all that you really need. Uh, if we have the basics of life, we should be content. Uh, does Paul mean that Christians should not be rich, or that rich people can't become Christians, or that in order to become Christians, they have to abandon their wealth? Not at all. Uh, the Bible never condemns a man or a woman for simply being rich. Uh, yes, some Christians uh, behave like somehow rich Christians is an oxymoron, you know, a contradiction in terms. Just like just like those who are into health and wealth prosperity treat poor Christian like an oxymoron, like something's weird. Like somehow, if you're if you're a poor, somehow you're not blessed by God. Uh, neither neither view is correct. Uh, you can be a, a Christian who has who's poor. You can be a Christian who's wealthy. Um, and both of those have response. Both of them have responsibilities before the Lord, as we're going to see. Um, but there's no condemnation in the actual thing of wealth. It's the lusting after wealth that is wrong. Uh, like Rockefeller, when he was asked how much is too is too much, and he said just a little more, just a little more. And that's the mindset of some Christians: just a little more. And we have to be careful with that. The Bible condemns those who lust after wealth. Who make wealth and possessions their gods. It also condemns those who have wealth and do not use it to help others. And we're going to see this when we get to verse 18. But I want to read verse 18 from the New Living Translation. It says, Tell them, those who are rich, to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give generously to those in need. Always being ready to share with others whatever God has given to them. And we're going to see that that's part of the major issue there. Uh, that if the Lord's blessed you with things, uh, He blessed you with things so that you be a blessing yeah. to others as well. Not simply for you to have them and enjoy them. Yes, enjoy them. Have them. But, you know, in that overabundance, also be generous to the people who have needs. Especially those who are impoverished and, and, uh, 
and can barely make make it by who you know who need food or clothing or whatever it may be. Uh, the rich believer is to view their wealth as a blessing from God that is to be used to help others. It is to be used to do good things. We're not simply uh, given things so that we can be fat hogs and enjoy them. Um, it is a blessing that is to be poured out over uh, 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 over from them to others. As one commentator tells us, it is not the possession of riches, but the love of them that leads men into temptation. And uh, and that's going to lead us into verses 9 and 10. Any question there? Verse 9. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Um, an obsession with acquiring wealth is a, is a self-feeding fire. It is destructive. It consumes not only our time and energy, but it also makes us compromise our values. Strangely, this remedy, money, leads to uh, more to ruin than to wealth. Uh, the problem is not simply you're acquiring, you're acquiring wealth, but even people who are acquiring wealth, what they're willing to do to acquire that wealth, uh, how they compromise their very value, the, the morality, the things that they believed in, they may compromise them to acquire even more. Or once they get that money, they feel that they are beyond good and evil, they're beyond values, and, they, and somehow because they're rich or famous, whatever, they feel that now they can get away with whatever they can get away with. And of course, many people do. Many people who have money have gotten away with many things. You know, they would be, they've been able to get off because they have money and people have catered to them. Uh, but again, this is, this is the temptation that they confront. Paul sets out for his readers the dangers of the love of money in both general and specific terms. First, the pursuit of wealth leads them to a road filled with every variety of pitfall. The words temptation and trap May, be, may well be used with Satan's manipulations in mind. And we're going to see, we're going to, when we look closer at those words, that indeed it's, it's used uh, with the enemy in mind. That the enemy uses uh, our very desire to have wealth as a temptation to lead us away from the things of God, to lead us into disaster. So these words that Paul is using is very much in connection with, with Satan and what Satan does. To, to lure us into destruction. Uh, and of course, it leads to foolish and harmful desires. Not only are, are, are not only for are for wealth itself, but also probably immoral cravings unleashed by access to, to wealth. Again, like I said before, those who, who acquire who are seeking to acquire wealth may compromise their morals. Those who have acquired wealth may feel that somehow they're beyond morality. You know, right now we're looking at the uh, the case of that lady who's um who worked with Epstein, and you see individuals there again because they were wealthy. They felt that they're they're beyond you know, which is a shame because you know that in many ways they're going to get away with this yeah. because they're not even coming up in the trial. What's coming up is the victims, but not the people who victimized them, uh, who used them. Again, wealthy wealthy men who believed that somehow because they were rich, they could they could be pedophiles. They could be. They could legalize their their pedophilia by going somewhere else and doing what they were doing. Uh, again, and unfortunately, what we are going to find out is that they they probably will not uh, be held responsible. They they will they'll they'll be finding loopholes to to get away with it. It's very rare when when the wealthy pay for it. Obviously, we saw that. Um, what was that guy's name? Uh, I, I didn't even know about him until he did. Uh, he faked his own attack, Jesse or J J whatever his name Jesse is. Jesse Smollett. Yeah, Smollett. Yeah, Jesse Smollett. there, that's his name. That you know, again, you think that because you have wealth, you're going to to get away with it, but you're not. Gonna, in, in, in his case, uh, two days of community service. Yeah, he probably will. He probably will have a, a you know a, a lower sentence than. That's that's if he can. You know, like they were saying, if he can produce uh, some sort of humility and, and some sort of remorse, you know, yeah. uh, fake it enough, and, and he probably will be lowered down. And, you know, uh, and you think about it, you know, it's like... Like, a, like a Alec Baldwin did in the interview, just cry and cry and cry, and people be sorry for you. Yeah. Well, I see Alec Baldwin, I think it's a, it's a, it's a bit different. Um, I, I don't think there was malice uh, in what he did. No, not that yet. I don't think so. I mean, if he did, it'd be that. That'd be really weird. But I don't think there was malice. I just think it was. It was a. It was incompetence. It was. 
things not handled properly. But I don't think there was malice. I don't think he wanted to murder or harm another human being. But um, I think it was just incompetence and, and uh, not not following the right protocol to how to deal with things. But the thing with uh, with this Jesse guy was legit. He actually paid people to to beat him up. I mean, and, and make it look and make it look like uh, he was innocent. You know, like he it was a racial thing. And of course, uh, but again, there's a good chance he'll get away with it, you know. Just like what was it? What was the other guy? Oh man, it was. Um, oh, I can't remember his name now. The guy from uh, Jello Gelatin and um, the black actor. Oh my goodness, I can't. Bill Cosby. Bill Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby. Oh, I like Bill Cosby. Yeah, he got off the hook. Yeah. yeah they, no, he's in jail. I mean, he was in jail, right? No, he's off. He's off. Uh, what was the loophole that they found? They found a loophole. Uh, again, he's got the lawyers. They found the loophole. They made a mistake in the way that they interrogated the, the witnesses. Uh, and they used witnesses uh, beyond where they should have used them. Some sort of technicality like that. No, he's he's free. He gets to go home. Uh, you know, so there, you know, there goes that, you know. Um, money, money definitely pays to be able to get away with, uh, with what he did. But again, there is uh, there. But there again, we do see the temptation that because yeah. he was so wealthy, he imagined that he can get away with what he did, and he did for so many years, and and now he's only getting away with it because again, a loophole that is ex that the lawyers that he can afford that other people cannot afford <laughs> got him off. And, you know, of course, his, his reputation is damaged beyond belief. He'll never, you know, he'll never, be, he'll never be able to get that back. But he's still wealthy. And he's, he's still going to, you know, you know. He'll never, again. He'll, never, he'll never do another commercial like that again. He probably won't be used for anything, you know. But again, when you get to have power, that's, that, that station, you get to take, and he, again, he, he did it. So, any questions, comments? Paul describes three fatal steps taken by an individual. First, of course, is, is temptation a trap. The first thing is the enticement, the, the devil enticing people uh, to fall into all these, uh, to lure them into these things. The enemy uses wealth and possessions to lure individuals into destructions. The individual is so dazzled by wealth and possessions that they do not see the trap. And before they can see it, it entraps them. So the temptation uh, is the lurement, and then they're entrapped. The second stage is, it's a downward spiral. It leads to many foolish and harmful desires. Uh, J.B. Philip renders it all sorts of silly and wicked desires. One would imagine that acquiring wealth would lead to happiness and satisfaction. Instead, it leads to other sinful desires. Rather than fulfilling desire, it creates a greater hunger in the individuals. And again, we see a lot of that in the world. We see people who, who acquire wealth and then they end up in, a, in some sort of drug addiction. You know? Uh, I mean, think about it. Uh, people who have so much money that they can get all the drugs they want, and that's the only form of happiness they know now. And and I remember, uh, you know, when I see these actors, actresses, who overdose, you, you they you just and you're like, oh my goodness, you you made all these films, you people knew you, people, right. and yet you were empty, you were empty, and some of them didn't even didn't even do drugs until they got into acting. And once they got into acting and they somehow or other, they got connected with the drugs and before you know it, now they're addicted and that's it. That's it. It's over. So, I mean, even though wealth should be the place where you say, well, you know, I, I have all these things. I can finally rest. I have satisfaction. I don't need to worry about, you know, my bills. I don't have to worry about anything. It, it creates an enticement to do other things that they shouldn't do. Uh, and again, with that boredom, they go and, you know, uh, and they go do worse things. And then, I remember when I saw the movie about... Um, Freddie Mercury uh, from the from the band Queen. He was just like that also. He and you know in the movie he says you know it's like that he was just bored. He was bored. You know he, he wanted to fill up the empty spots. And so how did he do it? By having all these sexual relationship with which he ended up getting AIDS and and all the drugs that he was taking. Uh, you know so I, I, again it's just that's just the the, the situation that the enemy creates uh, to entice people to fall into these things. Uh, the acquisition of wealth makes people do things uh, that are rather stupid, things that they never would have done, things that at one time they would have considered mindless or unreasonable. Oh, I, oh now let me jump off from this because I do remember what I was going to say also. Um, I saw this even in people that were poor and they become rich, like people who win the lotto. 
uh, there was this there was this show that for a while I watched it. Just you know, I was bored. I said, I want to see this. I want to see this thing because they they the amazing thing about people that became millionaires by winning the lotto, and then how they squandered their whole money. Yeah. Within like three four years, they were dead poor. They lost the money. Their money was uh, was robbed by swindlers, or they ended up wasting it on ten cars, ten houses, ten this, and then they had to sell everything, and they were poor. They were bankrupt, and there was one guy. Which to me was the the saddest one of all. Really, it was the saddest person I saw. He was rich, and he ended up buying all these cameras, and basically living in his house, fearful that people were going to steal what he had. Really. And he would be fixated, looking at the cameras to make sure nobody was breaking his house or stealing his property or doing anything to the thing. I said, "How sad!" <laughs> now he's got all this wealth, and he can't even enjoy it because he's afraid that someone's going to take it from him. You know, uh, and uh, but. Out of all the people you saw that got wealth, the only ones that were okay were people that were okay without it to begin with. They didn't treat the money like anything special. On the contrary, some of them that got rich uh, with the lotto didn't even use the money. They had put it away, but they had no intention, you know, oh, I'll leave it to my kids or whatever. They had no intention. They still lived the way they were living. They still went to their job. They still did their things. They, they, they continued their lives like nothing. Um, but it was those who got obsessed with it that uh, it, led, it led to great, great things that they, they never would have done. They did. So, I mean, but again, that's another another example. It's not only the rich people, but those who are poor who will suddenly become rich who end up uh, going through all that. So, again, the acquisition of wealth makes people do uh, things that are rather stupid. Things they never would have done. Things that at one time they would have considered mindless or unreasonable. Uh, but now that they have acquired wealth, they find themselves doing them. They do things without mentally or morally thinking about the consequences. They begin to lose the capacity to distinguish right from wrong. Uh, it's like it's very much like the influence of alcohol. You know, anyone anyone here, you can all lie and say you never drank. You know, that you never been intoxicated. But I can tell you, once you drink, uh, if you lose that sense of control, you're gone. You're gone. I've seen people that are drunk; they'll confess anything to you. Or they'll do the dumbest things that things that they never did. Uh, they would do, uh, and so I was always very cautious to be not to be intoxicated because of that. Yeah. But good to, good to know. but I I've done it. You know I've done it, and you do you lose you lose control of your of your body. You lose control of your mind. You you know you you would do things that you never would have thought about doing. Um, I remember when I was working as security guard once in uh, the buildings down here. Uh, it was fifty seven in Hudson, uh, the towers there. I can't remember the name of it. Of the two towers there, and and I was there, and all of a sudden the the roof alarm went off, and when I get up there, there's this drunk guy, and I, I'm thinking the first thing I thought he wants to jump off, you know, it's like we're near Christmas and the guy's gonna jump off this ledge, so I'm talking him down, I'm doing all my pastorly things to talk to him down, thinking he wants to commit suicide. Once I get him calm enough, I realize he's so drunk. And he had forgotten his keys and he lived on the penthouse. He somehow imagined that he was going to be able to come from, jump off the roof onto the other little roof that was there and then go into his, into his balcony and get into it. I said, oh, my goodness, this guy would have, this guy would have gone splat. <laughs> There's no way in his condition he was going to do anything. anything. You know, but we had to, I told him, no, no, look, the super will open the apartment for you. Is that, and he actually waited, thank God. <laughs> and we were able to get him off the roof and open his, uh, go into his penthouse. But he literally was so intoxicated that he lost control. He really believed in his mind that he, he he's going to be able to go from this roof onto his other, because of course they wasn't right into the balcony. Uh, the pen floor had a, had another extra roof to make sure people couldn't do that very thing. So you had to get on this roof and then go into jump, you know, slide into the back. He would have slid right down. He would have gone down. So, but, and, and, you know, people that get, get lost in the world, it's, it is like alcohol. They get intoxicated. They lose their mind. They lose their sense of right and wrong. They lose sense of, uh, of their morality. And they do things that are just, they never would have done otherwise. Uh, but again, wealth can do that to people. It, it, can, it can blind them uh, to the reality. And of course, with it, it brings, of course, uh, a great deal of pain and misery and again, we see all the all the dangers people get in uh, get into because of uh, lusting after wealth. Any questions? 
I'm sorry. I'm just a little lost. What passage are we reading? First Corinthians, uh, First Timothy, chapter six, and we're on verse nine. Okay. We have uh, the whole passage about the love of money. We're going to get that soon. Um, so yeah, we're talking about wealth and what wealth uh, does to people, and uh, Paul warning us about the dangers of lusting after these things. Um, riches, of course, do this unto us until they plunge the person into ruin and destruction. The imagery here is that of a monster who grabs a hold of and plunges the individual into an ocean of complete destruction. The person is completely inundated by, by their hunger for more. They set out to possess more and more greed, and in the end, it ends up possessing them. What was supposed to bring them happiness has brought them destruction. Paul uses two words for destruction. Uh, the point he is trying to make is that it's a total destruction. That's why I use these two different words. A destruction that encompasses this life as well as the life to come. Uh, again, wealth doesn't only destroy you in this world. If you're destroyed in this world, you're also destroyed in the world to come. Uh, you know, just like Jesus said, what does man gain if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? Um, so yeah, not only does it plunge you into destruction here, but it leads into the further destruction of hell. Because the person has, has completely departed from the things of God. The person who is greedy imagines that they can gain the world without losing anything. The truth is that they lose the most valuable thing that they have. They lose themselves. Uh, all that they acquire is not worth a fraction of their soul. Uh, and yet people don't realize that. That the most, you know, like, like and, and yet you, you mean, it's not like, again, this is like a novel idea for Christianity. You see it, I see it in movies all the time, when people tell, tell other people, you know, don't, don't sell your dignity, you know, you're worth more than that, don't sell yourself short. You see that, constantly, that, kind, of, that kind of language constantly in movies about the importance of, of the dignity of who you are as a person, and not to compromise those principles, and yet people will compromise those principles to get things that they think will make them happy, and then in the end it doesn't make them happy, it makes them miserable. Any questions? Yes, that's so true. I get so many testimonies of people regretting stuff like that. Yeah, they start out. They start on a course that sounds like they're going to be happy, and they end up end up in pure misery. I mean, that's good if it leads to Christ. That's good. You know, every single testimony that you hear. I mean, it's a shame that that happened to them. It's a shame that a person that may end up in in drugs or end up you know in some sort of uh, immoral lifestyle or, or, or ends up losing everything, that's a shame. But if that means their salvation, then thank God. It's better for them to lose those things and save their soul than to have those things and lose their soul uh, in this life and in the life to come. So those who end up in misery and that leads them to Jesus, praise God. But let's hope not, you know. It'd be great if, you, if we'd be able to have the things that God has for us and enjoy them without uh, getting messed up, without doing things that are wrong. And again, this doesn't just go for, for people in the world. I remember uh, when I was listening to, I listened to a story about ministers, you know, like Ted Haggard, the, the minister who, uh, very well-known Pentecostal preacher, you know, doing very well. Um, he, he, in order to keep up his energy, he started using over-the-counter stuff that would give him energy. Before you know he started using drugs, to give him energy, he started. He started getting addicted to uh, to I think it was uh, heroin or something like that, to to be able to keep up with everything he was doing. So he you know he slept, he didn't sleep much. He was always working in ministry or ministry. He's the guy's doing ministry. Of course, he's making money because he's you know he's like a, one of those uh, big prosperity kind of guys. Uh, but here here's where the even even goes into a weirder corruption when he couldn't afford the drugs. He actually started having homosexual relationships with this man so he can get money from him so he can buy more drugs. Uh, or, that the, or that the man would give him the drugs. I mean, it really got bad. I remember watching his story on, uh, on HBO because he ended up becoming, um, when he left the ministry, of course, he couldn't go back into the ministry. He ended up becoming like a salesman. And they did it, you know, of course, they don't do a documentary on Billy Graham, but they did a documentary on this guy, you know, <laughs> because he got so messed up. And they love that. You know, I guess HBO loves that. Ah, Christian messed up real bad. You know, let's do a story on him. Yeah. And yet, ironically, by the time the documentary ends, we find out that he's restarting ministry again. 
And I'm like, oh, I hope he, I hope he stays away from the very dangers. But he destroyed himself. If you watch him in his ministry, and then you listen to him after the drugs and everything, you can tell that mentally he's not the same person. He doesn't have the same mental capacity. You can tell when you see a person that's been destroyed themselves on drugs. Like, you know, you just don't, you don't know anymore. You know, they, they, they don't have the same capacity to be able to communicate and handle things they handled before. You know, and uh, if anybody has a friend that have been in drugs and you see how they changed. And it's, it's just a shame to see them uh, no longer really be able to do the things that they were able to do at one time because... They destroy, you know, you destroy them. Like I tell people, you kill brain cells, they, they, they don't rejuvenate. <laughs> Other cells can, can be rejuvenated, not brain cells. You kill any brain cell that you kill, it dies. It's gone. It's not coming back. <laughs> you know, they haven't found a solution for that one. Maybe one day they will, but right now they haven't. So uh, anything we kill, you know, and of course you see people like this. It's a shame. You know, any questions, comments? All right. Verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Uh, here Paul states in a proverbial fashion a summary of what he has been saying so far. Such proverbial wisdom, of course, uh, uh, against the dangers of greed can be found in many ancient writers, not only Christians. Uh, it is important to point out certain things about this proverb because it has so often been misquoted and misused. First, we see, as we've already stated, that Paul condemns the love of money, not money itself. Uh, many times people say, uh, money is the root of all evil. That's not what it says. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Uh, I've heard this passage being quoted that way quite often. Money in and of itself is not evil, nor is the acquisition of money evil. Falling in love with money and doing everything possible to acquire it is what is being condemned here. Another thing to, to point out is that the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, I know the King James Version says the root of all evil, uh, but that is an incorrect rendering of the Greek. <gasps> he attacked the King James. Oh, okay, well, King James. Oh, all those King James people now, ban him, ban him. The, the King James is the, the only word of God is the true word of God. No. Uh, greed is, no, is not the root of all evil. The Bible makes it very clear that there are other roots of evil, like pride, like lust. But greed is a root of evil. Uh, all kinds of evil come from it. Uh, we know that greed has been known to give birth to fraud, perjury, stealing, political corruption, and of course, murder. The Bible gives many examples of greed, but of course, the most poignant example, of course, is Judas. Uh, Judas fell in love with money and was known to be taking money from the money bag that was kept by Jesus and the disciples. He was actually the treasurer. You know, gives a bad name to treasurers. <laughs> the treasurer of the group. On one occasion, Judas became furious because an expensive perfume was poured over Jesus and Judas stated that they could have gotten a great deal of money by selling it and could have used it to help the poor. And of course, other disciples agreed with that as well. Uh, but of course, uh, I think it's John. John the Apostle points out that Judas' concern was to get money for himself. He wasn't concerned about the poor. We could have used that money to help the poor. <laughs> He's thinking, yeah, the poor me. <laughs> poor me, I want that money. Yeah. Judas becomes so uh, consumed with greed, of course, that he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which is uh, just shameful. And yet it also leads to him to commit suicide because of the great remorse that he feels over what he has done. So a, a classic case of someone who becomes consumed with acquiring and he's stealing. I mean, stealing from, from ministry and from Jesus' ministry, which, you know, you're, you're not very rich. <laughs> it's, not like, it's, not like, uh, it's not like Joel Osteen Ministries uh, where, where you can hide that. You're, did you hear about that money that they found in Joel Osteen's church? Yeah. They found the money. It looks like somebody had put it in uh, behind the, uh, the toilet thing. Yeah, two by four. Yeah. yeah, they're hidden behind the toilet. So that eventually they can take it out. They they never walked out of church with it. They put it there, and I guess eventually, I guess eventually they were planning on taking. Somehow they messed up and never, never got to it. So. No, they found that in the church or in the, his house. No, the church. In the church. In okay. the church, yeah. Uh, the a plumber was called in to do some work on the right. on the toilet because it was wrong. So he had to remove it. Had to remove the back pee because something was wrong, 
And when he removed it, he found all this money. <laughs> and uh, a while back, I can't remember how long ago, six hundred thousand dollars had been st st stolen from the from the offering on a Sunday. And apparently, the, what must have happened is whoever stole it must have placed it there, and must have thought, "I will eventually come back to get it." Uh, but the plumber found it, and, and the plumber was like, <laughs> "You know." So the cops were called in. But yeah, you know, again, you see the uh, the things that you know. But you know, Judas, of course, stealing from the money bag of Jesus, it's, he's poor to begin with, and yet he's stealing from that. And hoping to get more money, and of course, thirty pieces of silver uh, is is a is a nice is the nice uh, amount of money there. Uh, thirty pieces of silver, he could he could have lived very well, uh, but again, he after he he does this, he realizes the uh, the great evil that he's done. He feels remorse and uh, kills himself. And of course, many people have speculated as to why that change of heart uh, in, in the Gospel of Judas. If you have ever come across it, uh, I read it and. Um, it's interesting because the whole point is that uh, Judas actually is supposed to be the good guy, and he does he betrays Jesus because Jesus tells him to. Uh, but that's definitely a speculation to the max of like, no, that's not true at all. But you wonder maybe maybe Judas was imagining that if he pushed Jesus, that maybe Jesus would bring the kingdom with power. Maybe he would, if being pushed to do something, he would find, because he wanted Jesus to definitely be like a zealot, to be someone who who would, you know, pick up arms against the Roman Empire. And it looks like, no, his plans failed, and, and yet he wanted that. And when it didn't work, um, and Jesus, of course, is betrayed, and he ends up being handed over, he feels remorse for what he's done. But again, the remorse leads to suicide rather than to uh, repentance. Um, because people always say, oh, you know, did he ever, he didn't really repent. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that there's, uh, you can feel sorrow, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be repenting. Like I may be sorry that I got caught, but I'm not sorry necessarily for what I did and I wouldn't do it differently. And I don't change my mind about what it is. Repentance is that we actually realize what we did is wrong and we go in the opposite direction. And Judas doesn't do that. He kills himself. And the word repentance is never used of him. Any questions? Uh, this leads uh, me to the point that Paul makes in the latter half of the verse. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Uh, greed isn't something that only affects non-believers. It is something that can affect anyone. Christians are not immune to the love of money. So Paul warns us that some Christians have been led astray because they fell in love with money. Uh, these individuals lost their way. In the Greek, the verb is passive. Uh, they were led astray. Money distracted them. And before they knew it, they had wandered off the Christian path. And certainly, you know, we've heard many stories of Christians like that who were, who were uh, doing very well in the faith. And then because of their career, because of whatever, they became distracted and ended up becoming in love with money. I remember a, a man who was a worship leader in the first church I was in. You know, wonderful, wonderful uh, worship leader, great guy. Um, and he was also, he also worked on a radio show as a talk host. Well, he, he became better and better at being that talk host. And before you know it, he had a chance to acquire a greater position. Uh, I think it was down in Florida. And he ended up, ended up having an affair leaving his wife and child and ended up in in uh in Florida as this as his radio host making more money and having more of, of that he actually left the things of the lord so i mean it's not it's not unheard of and yet when i knew him he was undoubtedly a man of god uh you know uh always you know always uh, emphasizing things of christ uh an example in, in the way that he talked and the way that he lived the way that he loved his wife, and he was so happy when he when he got a child because they they weren't expecting it was a, I think it was like unexpected surprise, and yet he abandons all that because of, because of the world. Uh, and this of course leads him to question. No, and this of course leads him to many griefs. Uh, yes, someone's talking. Oh, no, it just, no, it's me. It's like. Uh... When the Lord talks about it in the in one of my uh, favorite parables, the parable of the dishonest manager, when He makes it uh, clear 
Yeah, you cannot serve two masters. Yeah. You cannot be slaves to two masters, either money or God. He makes it like really clear. He says use your money to gain yourself back for heaven. But he makes it clear, like it's a really uh, thorough parable that he talks about. Of course, the Pharisees get mad because they love money, but yeah. that was the point. And Bob, Bob Dylan agrees. <laughs> you can't serve God and money. Uh, that's a fact. Well, you can't serve God and anything else, period. It's just a fact. You cannot have two gods. They can only be one God. Um, nothing else can, can, can replace him. Nothing else can stand beside him. Uh, whether it's our careers, our spouse, our children. Oh, little girl. Yeah, nothing, nothing. This is the one time, this is the, this is the one time that the Lord specifically, like, I always think like because of everything that you're, we're, we're learning today, that really I see it, especially being in this industry, I see people who, you know, work really hard to save the money. And there's always people with money and they can't buy a house in here, and especially here in this, in this state. Um, but it is really, it's, it's amazing how they have idols, but their money is either God himself or money. There's idols, but I've seen how money is a God. I've seen it like in the most simplest people. They have idols, like Jesus can be a bit of an idol, Mary. They're idols, but they're not the God. The money is a God. Hmm. That's I've seen that in the most simplest yeah. lives of people. Well, yeah, and the thing is that that's that's really an illusion because Jesus, Jesus, uh, God won't play second fiddle to anybody else. Uh, God, God is going to be number one in our lives, or He's not going to be in our lives. It's really that simple. And I think people who try to kind of keep God somewhere on the somewhere on the level of their existence, you know, okay, God's not number one in my life, but He's number five. He's in the, He's in the top five. Well, He's not really there. He's only there in your imagination, uh, because that's you know He's a jealous God. He does He will not stand for any rivals, um, which makes sense, you know. Uh, if, if God really is God, then He defines everything. Of how things should be and he makes it very again he wants us to have our spouse he wants us to have our children he wants us to have our house he wants us to have our car he wants us to have all these things but he doesn't want any of those things to be our god all those things have to be beneath us you know we're the stewards of those things uh living as god wants us to live and and the way we deal with those things uh but none of those things are to take number one spot uh everything the number one spot is god everything else is beneath him we are beneath him, and then uh, we serve him that way. And again, I feel sorry because I know that unfortunately there are many there are many people who call themselves Christians, who who uh, who really are not Christians. They're 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 in love with this world. They're in love with the things of this world. And and God is again, it's most like you know, like you said, it's like an idol. He's like a like a little totem, a little a little good luck charm or something that they that they call upon when they need him. Uh, and they'll reference him in their language, but he really is not Lord of their lives. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we always had that expression when I was a young Christian, you know, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And right. we knew this. We knew that, that his Lordship means just that, that he's Lord, he's master, he's owner. And people don't like that language. If you can't say that God is your owner, God is your master, you have a problem. You know, Paul had no problem with that. Paul, one of Paul's favorite titles is that he's a slave of Christ. Um, he's property of Christ. And again, people don't see that. People see God working for them. God, God is my God, almost in a possessive sense. I own him, you know, and that's why they can, that's why they can demand of him. That's why they can say to him, why, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You know, if God is above us, then that's when we're, every time we're in the saying, God, why didn't you? We're saying, mm, okay, God is God. And his, it is his, his prerogative to do things as he pleases. Uh, he doesn't go by our agenda. He goes by his own agenda. And and we don't comprehend the mind of God fully. We, we understand him, but certainly not to the point where we can know every intricate detail of why he permits this or why he permits that or why he's doing this or not doing that. 
Uh, and so we have to submit to his will and we have to be humble, realizing that, that we have these limitations. But we never take the place of God and we never allow anything else to take the place of God. But yeah, unfortunately, there are many people out there who this is, you know, they think they own God. They own God. And certainly they think they own God if they're tithing or whatever. And they think somehow because I'm, I'm giving money to the church or I'm giving that somehow I own God and God has to do these things for me. I, I just, it's it's just crazy, crazy stuff, you know. Any other comments? No. All right. So this, uh, you know, so they're being led astray by these things, and that's passive. They're being tempted, but then we see that it turns into into a uh, positive thing, uh, uh, an active thing. The verb uh, many grieves is active. Uh, they pierce themselves. They were led astray. You know, you're, you can be seduced by things in the world and in a very ignorant way kind of follow along with it. But there's a point where you now are aware that you are following along and you can either choose to not follow or to follow. And obviously these individuals who were being lured by these things, there came a point where they accepted what they were doing and they ended up piercing themselves. Uh, you see, you may be distracted by something that is sinful it might get off the past, but there is a point where you have to choose, where you are allowed to choose. You know, uh, just like you know, just like just like um, Jesus, uh, Paul. Sorry, Paul, not Jesus. Paul tells in First Corinthians eleven that uh, when we are faced with temptation, there's always an exit sign. There's always a way to escape. There's always a, you're never in a position where you are tempted and you cannot get out. Oh, because then then you are innocent. Then, you know, then you really have an excuse. I could turn to God and say, God, there was no exit. <laughs> you know, if there's no exit, I'm, I, I'm not guilty. You know, if, if I, if on every, if on every, if everywhere I turn, there's a tiger, I'm going to face a tiger. I'm, I'm doomed. But, but the Bible makes it very clear. That's not true. There's always a way where you can get out. There's always a way where you can turn away from it. Uh, and these individuals chose not to do that. They did not turn away from it. They went into it. Uh, but there is that point where you do get to escape. Uh, and unfortunately, these people do not. And of course, they, they pierce themselves. They impale themselves. They are the ones who, who end up bringing about their own demise because they continue on that path that they realize they should not be on. And this leads to many griefs. It leads to, of course, to great remorse for what one has done. The Holy Spirit impresses upon us the pain that we are causing God by our disobedience. Uh, so, you know, the first thing we realize is that when you begin to wander off, the Holy Spirit will show you that you're wandering off. You'll begin to feel remorse for what you're doing. You know you should not be doing this. You, should, you know you, not, you should not be going to this place. You know you should not be indulging these thoughts. You know you should. But, and the Holy Spirit is trying to convict you. And that's the first thing we feel is that remorse. We, we realize that we then begin to lose that beautiful rela relationship that we have with God. And, it, and then it gets replaced by an illusion. If you begin to disobey God, if you begin to walk on the path of sin, if, you're, if you are on a path of disobedience, you are, sin becomes an interference in our relationship with God. It's like now you can't hear the voice of God. Now a static takes over, you know. Uh, and you and you cannot hear clearly what God wants you to do, what God wants you to uh, to be, where He wants you to where to go, because sin is interfering. So then, it, it, it not only brings you remorse, first you feel the remorse, you also uh, see the relationship uh, being destroyed. There's also the grief of illusion because we learned the hard way that money cannot give what we thought it could. Uh, it doesn't give us fulfillment. Instead, it leaves us hungry and unable to satisfy. So again, it's almost like you you go this far. And you think that this thing is going to satisfy you. And then it's like, you know, you think it, it's almost like being in a desert. And it's, it's a mirage. And you think, you think the sand is water and you go to drink it and it's all in the sand. You only become thirstier. Uh, you're never satisfied. We learned the hard truth, uh, the, the hard way. We learned the hard way, the truth about the Bible, what the Bible says when it, when it says that you will eat and not be satisfied. You will drink and yet remain thirsty. Uh, so, you know, the Bible makes this very clear. When we try to follow after the gods of this world, the things that we believe are going to satisfy us, they don't. We will take in and take in and take in, but we will never be satisfied. We will always be hungry. 
And of course, there's also the grief of reaping the results of our sinfulness. Uh, this may mean that, uh, that for the love of money, we defrauded others, and then we got caught, maybe brought to justice. The Bible tells us the pleasures of sin are for a season. I love that passage. Uh, I love that passage because I hate when people say that, oh, sin is not pleasurable, sin is bad. No, no, sin is pleasurable. If it wasn't pleasurable, we wouldn't do it. It is enticing and it is pleasurable, but for a time, for a time. You know, uh, uh, when people take drugs, oh, at first it may be a lot of fun. You're having fun and you're, you're joking around, you know, marijuana, whatever. Oh, it's great. But then you become addicted. You know, alcohol is very good at first, you know, but that being, being raised among alcoholics, I can tell you, it's not fun. It's destructive. You see people, you know, men in my family dying in their 50s because they were alcoholics. Not because they were old, just because they destroyed their livers. Uh, I mean, it's horrendous. Uh, my own brother died miserably because of alcoholism. Uh, he literally, he literally bled to death. He, you know, he has so destroyed his body that he started coughing up blood and literally just coughed up blood until he passed out and died. And, and, that's, the way, and that's the way he chose to live because he was addicted to alcohol. And even though he came close to stopping, because, you know, the, I remember year 2000, he was told, if you keep doing this, you're not going to make it to year 2000. And I was there with the hospital with him when, when he kind of put the brakes on for a while. But short, shortly after that, he went right back into it uh, and then passed away. So, I mean, it's, it's the misery. And there are consequences to, to abandoning God. There, there are consequences to doing things. When God says this is bad, it's bad. Stay away from it. People that do it pay a heavy price. In this life... And of course, unfortunately, in the life to come as well. Um, and, and that's the misery that we want to avoid. So, any questions? Comments? No? No. Well, I think we're going to stop there. Because uh, we went up to verse 10. And verse 11, I have a lot of notes on verse 11. Wow, wow I didn't think of never... Verse 11 has a lot of notes. How come verse 11 has a lot of notes? Oh, no, okay. Verses twelve to sixteen has more notes. That's what it is. But still, we'll stop. We'll stop at verse three. Verse eleven is: But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. That's a good place to stop. So we've seen the dangers of the evils of chasing after uh, greed, after lusting after wealth, and next week we'll pick up on the things that we should pursue as Christians. The good stuff that we should be pursuing. So any other comments, questions? So let me first say goodbye to Facebook. God bless you guys. See you soon. Bye.